Hello, Paul Chapman, and welcome to another one of my uh, Sabbath Bible lesson, uh, Teachers Helps. Um, this week we're going through uh, the uh, lesson number six, the righteousness of Christ revealed in the law. Now, last week um, I we went through our need for God's law, and I got a thumbs down. Now, I'm not sure if that's because of my presentation, that is because of the way I'm presented, or else... It's because of the subject matter, but uh, look, I'm happy to engage anyone in discussion, so if you'd like to uh, leave a comment as to why perhaps uh, you didn't enjoy the video, maybe give me some feedback there, help me improve it, or if it's regarding the content, regarding the uh, theological uh, message, please um, let me know, and I'm happy to uh, discuss that with you. So, for this week though, uh, we're going to go through the righteousness of the law, rather, the righteousness of Christ revealed in the law. Now, those who... As you've been watching, you'll know that uh, I'm using a markup in my lessons. As you can see, um, a new concept is the asterisk. Uh, a personal need is the arrow. A plus symbol means a personal help. And something the class should understand is the uh, pound symbol, the hash key. Now that hash symbol, I'm using that extensively because if I'm teaching the class, I'm using the hashes at the side there, as you can see. Um, down the sides here, so that, that helps me. Um, as I'm going through the lesson, I know where to hone in for this week or this particular day, uh, which points I want to bring out, particularly if I'm getting running out of time at the end of the lesson. Bell rings, five minutes to go, bang, I only got, I've still got two days to go, I know where I'm going to hone in on the points for that day, uh, so I can make sure I cover everything I want, wanted to cover. Now, um, this week's lesson, let's go through it and see how we go. Now, I apologize too, firstly, for because I'm a bit late, I was hoping to get this up earlier. For those of you who are getting this late, forgive me. Um, I'm trying to improve, so hopefully I'll get up earlier for next week. Now, um, let's go through this. The righteousness of Christ revealed in His law. Now, hopefully um, you've studied the lesson, and if you're a teacher, this is aid is designed for teachers. But if you're not a teacher, look, I'm sure you'll get something out of it as well. I hope you do. So let's uh, have a look at this. All right. Um, <clears throat> Now, I'm going, the principle I'm using is macro, micro, macro. That is, the main point of the lesson is the macro point. From what we studied, from the, from the yes, I've gone through the lesson for this week, what do I get as the main point of the lesson? This is what I want you to be bringing out in your classes, okay? Well, not necessarily my main point, but what do you think the main point is, if you're a teacher? And uh, I'd also, and then we uh, look at the micro points each day, uh, that, that helps support that main point, and then we summarize it all at the end, bringing it back to the main point uh, to justify it, and then to apply it on a practical level for our students. Now, um, I don't want you to be going through question, answer, question, like question, read the Bible verse, read the note uh, in the class. That's not teaching the class, as I've already mentioned in this series of videos. Um, what I want you to be doing is formulating your questions. Once you've formulated the main point of the lesson, what are the micro points and formulate questions to help bring those points out from your students because uh, that's how we en uh, you know, engage the classes I mean anyone can read the it doesn't take a teacher to stand up and read the lesson or read the question and and read the Bible verse and read the note that's not a teacher it's a teacher is one who's able to bring out from their students the, the most important aspects of the lesson to, to impart to them or to see that they've, been, they've uh, gained uh, the significant points of this lesson. So that's what it's all about. And so when you're formulating your questions, that's what I hope you're going to be doing. Um, in my seminars around the world, I teach us, uh, I, I, I take us through um, ways of doing that um, and hopefully um, you'll be along to one of those seminars if you haven't already been. Now uh, let's go through. So what's the main point of the lesson for this week? What do I get? Well, you know, in a, in a, very briefly, I, I think this is what I got out of it. As we uh, seek the righteousness of God by faith in Christ, the glory of that righteousness, which is God's law, will be fulfilled in us. Now, let's have a look at how this uh, is brought out now, or how this is... Yeah, it's support, supportive from the lesson. Firstly, our first uh, section, well, of course, the key note there, we're going to bring this out in the lesson, but the key verse is uh, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 3. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, manifested, or rather, ministered by us, uh, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God in uh, 
uh, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of the heart. That's um, what it's all about. Having God's, um, or us being the epistle of Christ, revealing Christ to the world around us by having his life, his principles, his character written in our hearts. And that character is, is manifested in the law of God. The glory that shone on the face of Moses was a reflection of the righteousness of Christ in the law. So let's have a look. Magnifying the law of God, the first section. Now we know um, when Moses, the questions asked here, what did Moses see in the built in beholding God's glory? You know, remember the question there, now the verse given here, Exodus 33, verse 18 and 19, and Exodus 34, 5 to 7, was the experience when Moses uh, asked the Lord to show him his glory. And God said, I'll make all my glory pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Now, this is an important point. God's glory is connected with his name. His name is, and then Exodus 34 tells us what that name is, the Lord the Lord God, or Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim, merciful, it says there, long, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity and sin, and will by no means, or showing mercy unto thousands, and will by no means clear the guilty. So, it's God's mercy, His love, His truthfulness, His justice. Um, this is the name of God. That's what happened when Moses, in response to Moses, asking God to show him his glory. God appeared before him, didn't see, Moses wasn't able to see his face, but he saw his backward pass, but then proclaimed his character to Moses, uh, that is his name. And that's, remember, what Jesus came to declare on this earth, God's name. He came down, as it says in part B, he said, I will magnify the law and make it honorable. And that uh, law is is uh, reflected uh, in the life of Christ. That's how he did that. Um, the law is a perfect, perfect expression. Uh, rather, Christ's life was a perfect expression of God's law, as the note brings out here. That's one of the main points I want to bring out. Um, and God requires perfection of his people. Now, don't get caught up on that word. Some do. Uh, perfection, I see it from the dictionary as the, um, from a moral point of view, it's the uh, expression of such moral qualities, uh, is this is from Webster's Dictionary, expression of such moral qualities and virtues as a thing is capable of. So whatever moral quality or virtues you and I are capable of in Christ, that's what God requires us to express. Okay, nothing short of that. That's all he's asking us to do. So let's have a look, um, and this is what this lesson will bring out. How can we express those moral qualities that we're capable of expressing? How do we show them? That's what this lesson will bring out for us. Um, now, the mission of Jesus in relation to God's law, the, the second half of this section brings out, is that he his came to magnify the law and make it honorable. That's an important point. I, I believe. Um, he said in Psalm 40 verse 8, we know that's refer referring to Christ because Hebrews 10 quotes it in relation to Christ. And, and Psalm 40 verse 8 says, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. That was the experience of Jesus. He had God's law in his heart. He delighted to do God's will. Now think about it. God's law in his heart as a man, as a human being, with God's law written in his heart. He was delighted to do God's will. Um, and it was to manifest or magnify that law that he came to this earth. And what is important, what I would like to hone, on, hone in on for this, this, uh, this question was 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6, that that light of Christ is the light that God shines in our hearts. It says to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's the light that God shines in the hearts of you and me to, to uh, bring us to a spiritual understanding of uh, the gospel of salvation. And it's the light of the glory of God seen where? In the face of Jesus. And remember, Jesus was the one who was magnifying God's law, making it honorable. And that's, in, and that's where God's glory may be seen. Now, this is um, brought out further here. Um, under 
Well, it'll be brought out further under section uh, three and four. But let's just have a look here now on the Monday's lesson, the, the glory of God's character. When we come to understand um, what happens, you know, when we come to understand uh, that Christ is the law of God revealed in human flesh, you know, what happens, you know, it's just understanding who Christ is. We are transformed by beholding. We become changed. That's an important principle. As we behold Christ, we become transformed. We become new creatures in Christ Jesus. That's what the verse brings out. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Now, I've got this uh, marked here, the note here, because I think this is an important point, And that is this, that uh, much is made about the imputed righteousness of Christ versus the imparted righteousness. Uh, Christianity, in general, uh, evangelicalism places a lot of emphasis on the imputed righteousness of Christ. It's that righteousness by which we are saved, or declared saved before God. Well, declared justified, if you like. And it's true, we are declared just before God by the imputed righteousness of Christ. But note what happens. It says here, by receiving his imputed righteousness through the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. So it's the imputed righteousness of Christ received through the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the, the, uh, we become like him. So yes, Christ's righteousness is put to our account as we receive that gift of righteousness. The Holy Spirit transforms us. And this is, brings about the new birth experience, the born again experience. And that transformation is the renewing. And what do we mean by renewing? It means we are turned from sin to holiness. We are no longer living a life in rebellion to God's law. We are living a life uh, led by the Spirit. And that Spirit leads us to do righteousness. We fulfill the law. And we'll see that brought out uh, later on in this lesson. Um, okay, But that's just one of the points we would emphasize there. And as we do that, we can expect warfare. You know, because human nature is opposed to the gospel of Christ. It's opposed to obedience. It's opposed to holiness. And so we can expect a warfare go, uh, to, to take place uh, when once we you know, experience this transformation, we're going to experience battles against the old man. Okay, But that's, that's to be expected. Um, but what we need to do is to continually surrender our will uh, to God so that he may continually transform us into his image. So um, our character is changed, as the, as the uh, part B brings out, by looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You know, by beholding, we become changed, remember, looking to Jesus. Uh, and the, the, um, the experience was given there in Numbers 11, rather Numbers 21, and in connection with John 3, verse 14 and 15, of the uh, serpent in the wilderness, that was uh, a poisonous serpent. Rather, the poisonous serpents were stinging the children of Israel. They were, they were biting the people, and the people were dying. Moses was commanded to make a serpent, uh, put it on brass, and the people were commanded to look. And whoever looked would live. And this was a lesson, object lesson, to look in faith to Christ and you shall live. Don't struggle under your burden. Don't, don't wallow in it. Don't die under it, but look and live. That's the principle there. And all who look to the cross of Calvary shall live. That's the wonderful promise that we have. And so, and we do that by looking to Jesus Christ, eating his flesh and drinking his blood. That's to receive him as a personal saviour. This is what we need to do. Um, and as we do that, um, how do we, or rather, how do we do that? By, if we, you know, by building on the rock. That is doing the things that Jesus told us to do. You know, but that's that with a natural response of a heart that's renewed in Christ, and so um, His attributes of character will be brought into our practical lives by all those who have um, who are looking to Christ to live. Okay, now just looking under under uh, Tuesday's lesson, the section here, two different ministries. Keep this in mind; it goes hand in hand with the old and the the old covenant and the new covenant. Now, I don't want to go in, we, we touched on this last week, but I don't want to go into it in detail now. We're going to the covenants. Maybe that's for another time. But but um, just want to f a focus here uh, between the two different ministries. The ministration under the old covenant versus the ministration under the new. And uh, that ministration 
uh, under the old covenant was called, interestingly, the ministration of death. Why? Why was it called the ministration of death? Well, two ways we could look at that. Uh, well, uh, well, in fact, it's, it's, it's a twofold way of looking at it. Uh, firstly, firstly, the administration of death that was in grace, it says here, the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. It, the administration of death had to do with what was written in the letter of the law, if you like. The letter of the law, what was written in stone, in tables of stone. Okay, we know from last week, what's the purpose of the law? It's not to make us righteous. The purpose of the law as written in the tables of stone, as written in the statutes and judgments of the Old Testament, the purpose of all that is to point out sin in our life. And as it points out sin, it says, He that doesn't do this shall die. And because it's made not for the righteous, but for the sinners, it's declaring that we're all destined to die. We're all doomed. Under, we're all condemned under death. We're condemned under that law. So it ministers death to us. That's what the law does. ministers death to us. And now God gives the ceremonial law as well, the sacrificial system, to teach us the way of life. But that sacrificial system in itself was a ministration of death because there was continual sacrifices for sin. This was pointing out that, that, uh, that sin requires price to be paid. The price for transgression of God's law, the wages of sin, is death, Romans 6.23. And so it was a constant ministration of death, condemning and sacrificing to, to um, fulfill the requirements of the law. That was the ministration of the old covenant, if you like. Uh, but the ministration of the new covenant is the ministration of life. Um, the spirit, the, the letter kills because it condemns us, but the spirit gives life. The spirit renews us, regenerates us, imparts a new life in Christ Jesus. This is, uh, and that spirit writes God's law in our hearts. We are known and read of all men. We're the epistle of Christ. People know us. Why? Because they see Christ in us. That's what God's law does. So this is what I'll be bringing out under this, uh, under that question there. This, this these aspects. Um, re remember, the blessing comes not to those who disobey, but to those that do His commandments, which is what Christ did, and Christ will fulfil that through the ministration of the Spirit of life. Um, now, in terms of the ancient Jewish Jews, um, the, the New Testament tells us there in Romans eight that. They followed after the law of righteousness. Now, this is an important point. I've, I've highlighted, don't want to bring this out in my lesson. Okay, I've marked this up. Um, that um, the Jews followed after the law of righteousness, but they didn't attain to the law of righteousness. Why? This is, this is important. Why? Because they sought it not by faith, but by the works of the law. That is, rather than exercise faith, Faith in God, feeling condemned, rather than exercise faith in the provision that God had given to them, that is the provision of salvation through Christ, which the sacrifices, the sin we're all pointing to, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, instead of showing faith in that provision, they, they it became a stumbling block to them. It was a stumbling block, and they stumbled at that stumbling stone, Jesus Christ and His righteousness. They couldn't accept that nothing they could do of their works would atone for their sin, would merit favour with God. We learned that last week, and uh, that was the problem here. So, um, and so being ignorant of that righteousness, they weren't about to establish their own righteousness, uh, and have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of Christ, or rather righteousness of God, which is Jesus Christ. But note this, it said there in Romans 9.32 that they sought it not by faith, but by the works of the law. So it wasn't that they were... Um, uh, let me just see here, because there's another point I want to bring out. Yeah. It, well, not that they were, there was nothing wrong with seeking the righteousness of the law, but it was the way they were doing it. Because remember, ultimately, we're bringing out under Thursday's lesson, which I've got highlighted as well, that the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us. You see, the Jews were seeking to establish their righteousness. They were seeking the righteousness of the law. They followed after the righteousness of the law, Romans 9.31.
But you know what? The Christian who didn't follow after the righteousness of the law will have the righteousness of the law fulfilled in them on the first day's lesson. We'll bring this out. So we're going to make the connection there. But that's an, just keep that concept in mind here. It's not that, oh, there's the righteousness of the law and there's the righteousness of Christ. No. There's the righteousness of the law which you can try and attain to it by your own works or we can trust and recognize, it, recognize that, yes, we're condemned sinners. We can then flee to Christ, trust in Him. And let the transforming agency of the spirit of life create us anew in Christ Jesus. And thus allow the righteousness of God's law to be fulfilled in our life. Okay. So, um, that's what I get there. So, let's uh, look now under Wednesday's lesson. Alright, so that's the main point under Tuesday. Um, I'm going quite quick through this. Uh, yeah. A little point here, I just want to bring out the note under Tuesday. The ritual service of the sanctuary was of no value unless connected with Christ by living faith. Even the moral law fails of its purpose unless it is understood in relation to the Saviour. Christ had repeatedly shown that his Father's law contains something deeper than mere authoritative commands. The law is not, <laughs> not something that we are to, to keep by, by merely external obedience okay the law is embodied in in the law is embodied the same principle that is revealed in the gospel the law points out man's duty and shows him his guilt that's what it does uh, to Christ he must look for pardon and for power to do what the law requires well looking to Christ for pardon and power the fact is when we look to Christ in faith the power of the Holy Spirit will be imparted to us to transform us to uh, make us anew in Christ Jesus. Okay, so looking from glory to, to greater glory, just seeing uh, under this section here, um, and this was talking now again about this ministration of death, it says, it was it's called the ministration of condemnation. Okay, there's the connection there under 2 Corinthians uh, 3 verse 9. It's called the ministration of, of condemnation. Because that's what it does. It condemns, the law condemns us. But under that law, that was glorious, so that when Moses came down, his face shone with that glory. Now, but that was to be done away. That is, that whole economy, the ministration of death with all those sacrificial systems of services, was to be done away with once Christ came. Now, under this ministration of, of the Spirit, the minute it's called the ministration of righteousness. Why? Because under this ministration, Christ's righteousness is imparted to you and me. His imputed righteousness is brought out or fulfilled in your life and in my life. That's what will happen in this uh, ministry. Uh, at Christ, uh, it says that it was much more glorious, the ministration of righteousness. Why? Because it was Christ who, who manifested that righteousness. He magnified it before the world. He gave honor to the law of God. He um, ex manifested it in every act of his life. It was far more glorious because uh, it was a living. He would cry in, in, it, because it was manifested in Christ as a living embodiment of all righteousness. All right. So um, I know what I bring out here. Also, I've, I've, I've uh, highlighted here for my class is that you know to in in the preaching that we uh, sorry uh, uh, we must preach Christ. You know. As a people, we have been uh, preaching the law. We have preached the law until we have become as dry as the hills of Geboa. Okay? That had neither dew nor rain. That was written in 1890. Remember, two years after the 1880 message came, first came in, to the General Conference in Minneapolis. Now, that's an important statement because that shows us why God sent that most precious message, as we learned in the beginning of our lesson, uh, of, our, of this quarter's lesson. So... Um, we, we preach the law until we become as dry as the hills of the Bible because we're not preaching Christ in the law. We're not preaching the law. We're not using it lawfully. We're preaching it as a as a standard to a, to attain to to um, to keep rather than as its purpose is to point out sin. Use it for using it for its purpose to point out the sinners that we might flee to Christ and find peace and justification with Him. And so we must preach Christ in the law. Uh, and there will be sap and nourishment in the preaching. There will be as food to the famishing flock of God. We must not trust in our own merits, right, at all, but in the merits of Jesus of Nazareth. 
Nazareth. Our eyes must be anointed with eye soul. We must draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to us, if we, if we come in His own appointed way. Now, and I like this too here, that the law itself would have no glory, uh, only that it in Christ, the law itself would have no glory, only that in it Christ is embodied. That's important. Uh, otherwise, it, it, without Christ in it, it's just a piece of, uh, it's just words on, on paper. It's got no glory whatsoever. Only as Christ is in that law. And he is the living illustration and fulfillment. Uh, his, he, Jesus was a living illustration of the fulfillment of the law. He's, remember, I would like to do the will of my God, thy law is within my heart. Psalm 40 verse 8. So that's what's the experience of Jesus. Um, and what will happen uh, for those who look to Jesus? The epistle of Christ will be, uh, well, we will become the epistle of Christ. His law, his life will be written on our law, rather our hearts. And our life will be a reflection of his life. Um, uh, as it says there in Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 33 we learned that from last week that's the promise of the new covenant God will write his law in our, our hearts and notice what it says there he will put his spirit within us and cause us to do what? to walk in his statutes and judgments and do them that in other words to walk in his laws and that is uh, Hebrews 10 uh, 8 verse 10 uh, quotes that um, and it's not just for Jews, it's for Gentiles as well. That he, This is what the Spirit does. Uh, it transforms us, renews us. The principles of God's law written in our hearts. There's no change in the law at all. It's the change in relationship to it. Rather than establish, trying to keep it, we uh, simply accept what it says, condemns us, accept we are condemned, that we are guilty, and then flee to Christ for pardon, forgiveness. And with that, we obtain the transformation of the Holy Spirit, bringing that new life in Christ Jesus to us. Okay, and so His righteousness will be revealed in us. Right, um, the sanctifying He will give His sanctifying Spirit to all who believe, and that leads us to our last section, uh, that is reflecting His glory. Um, you know, as First Corinthians fifteen forty nine. Now I know that's talking there about the uh, change of this mortal body to immortal or what happens when we are raised in the immortal body well as we are in the image of the earthly so we shall be in the image of the heavenly but notice this we are in other words we'll wear a, a similar image to our earthly image but it's going to be a heavenly image and i think that we can take that a step further what kind of heavenly image not just physical but moral as well and i see that as um as a reflection of or as alluding to the image of, of Christ in us. As it says in Romans 12, 2, that, um, look at Romans 12, 2, uh, let me just see, what did I say there, Romans 12, 2, sorry, let me just get that again, um, because I did have it before. Uh, oh yeah, that's it. Be you not trans conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your minds, uh, that you may be able to, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So that's what we, uh, that's what will happen uh, to us when our attention is focused on the glory of God. We will be transformed. We will be transformed into the uh, heavenly. The renewing of our minds will take place. Okay, in representing Christ to the world. Um, you know, we as a church are to reflect His image to the world around us. And when we receive Christ's righteousness, as it is revealed to us in His law, that is, we receive His right, His law by receiving Christ. <laughs> you know, not receiving the con. Well, we are already under the condemnation, but that has been removed as we express faith in Christ. Now, what happens is that He transforms us to bring us into harmony with that law. Okay, and so Romans 8 verse 4 brings out that um, uh, Romans 8 verse 4, which states, uh, where are we? Romans 8 verse 4, it says there that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. 
Okay, the, so I would emphasize that point. That's where the connection is that I mentioned before, uh, with the Jews seeking to uh, to uh, or that they followed after the law of righteousness, but never attained to it. Why? Because they didn't seek it by faith in Christ. But because we have sought it by faith in Christ, as we seek it by faith in Christ, what happens? The righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us. Why? Because we're not walking after the flesh. We're walking after the Spirit. You see, there's a transformation. There's a, a walk in Christ. There's an a, obedient, loving, uh, holy walk. And as we do that, His righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us. That's what it says there. And uh, Romans uh, 8 verses... 9 to verse 13 just brings that point out that it's by not by walking in the flesh but in the spirit uh, uh, you know, if God's spirit dwells in us um, we are then in the spirit um, and that spirit will uh, bring about this transformation where we can work the works of righteousness before the world before Christ before God okay and so just uh, in closing with this uh, note here um, Christ, that this is how it goes. I um, would bring out here that that this transformation, this walking in the Spirit, is allowing God's Spirit to transform us, to to work within us as the leaven or the yeast works in the lump of bread. It works within, and that change that has an, a physical change. There's a change of the bread that we see an outward manifestation of that change. So too spiritually. As the Holy Spirit works within us, there will be a change seen in our life, and uh, that that change will subdue us. Our our entire character will be transformed into the uh, likeness of the character of Christ. So that's what God requires: moral perfection. And uh, as we are, our character is changed in His likeness, we will be changed in that same image from glory to glory. That verse, by the way, we're going to we're going to bring out later on. Particularly next week, we'll look at. Um, uh, character is a sweet fragrance. This is really what God wants us to to uh, to manifest before the world. That's why He's changing us, you see, so so that we can be a wonderful fragrance to the world. We're going to look at that next week. But just to bring this home, uh, as you can, uh, that 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 um, as we can see f uh, from what we studied here, that Christ's righteousness uh, in that law uh, is is ever ever. Um, I just say, Christ's righteousness in the law is the glory of God, which is to be revealed in us. It was revealed in Christ. Christ fulfilled it. And through the imputation of that righteousness, connected with the transformation of the Holy Spirit, that righteousness will be fulfilled in you and I. And thus we will be led to reflect God's glory, the glory seen in the face of Jesus, the light that is lighted, that God uses to light every man that comes to this world. So may God bless us, and I uh, pray that uh, you've got something out of this that you can share with your classes. So anyhow, that's uh, it for this week. So if you've enjoyed this uh, this presentation, give me a thumbs up. Um, share any comments. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Until next week, uh, take care. God bless you, and hopefully I'll get this up before the Sabbath commences so that uh, everyone and even in Australia will be able to watch this uh, in time for the Sabbath school. You know, hopefully you'll get it tonight. So take care till next week. Uh, God bless you. Bye for now.